Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Anchor Star Wealth Market Update. I'm your host, Allison Anchor Star, and today we'll be talking about interest rates at a three year high, Bank of America's earnings, and what is Twitter's poison pill. But before we begin, as a reminder, this is a financial education presentation and should not be construed as personal financial advice. Full disclaimer information is available at anchorstarwealth.com. Good morning, Steve. Interest rates are at a three year high. What does that mean for the markets? Hey, good morning, Allison. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back after the long uh, three-day weekend there. Markets closed again on a good Friday. So hopefully you enjoyed your Easter. Uh, we took Thursday off as well. We did have some travel for a volleyball tournament and, uh, and, and some other things going on. So it's good to be back. Um, yeah, so the question is, what do we do with the interest rates that have now really you know, just continued to increase? So let's take a look at cnbc.com here. So the highest in three years for the treasury rates. So the the 10 year treasury note up to 2.864. Remember this was below, it was a big deal when it went above two and now it's approaching three, right? So you see the chart here, starting with the three month all the way out to the 30 year from a 0.78 all the way out to 2.916. And again, these are closely monitored interest rates that, uh, you know, know, that move all, all the time, but you want to make sure there's no yield curve inversion. Obviously, we fit that a few times, uh, which again is a predictor, not necessarily 100%, right? But uh, it does predict recessions, which is kind of the talk of the day. Everything is kind of in order, but you see the you know the the 10-year kind of moving up, and the 30-year really hasn't moved up more than the 10-year, you know, only fractionally, right? <clears throat> so you would kind of expect the 30-year to creep up higher here, uh, based off of this. When you translate that to the markets, what does it mean? Well, uh, any you know bond type funds, investing, all that stuff is again going to continue to get hit. Uh, I think we're near the bottom though on, on those investments. So I have moved out of some for some long-term hold uh, type folks. I've just kind of you know gritted our teeth to hold through that, and it's been kind of painful. Um, but you do get paid along the way. Most of these, most of your bond investments kick out a monthly. Uh, dividend that you're now reinvesting into that uh, while it while it's low, uh, so it'll be a slow, healthy recovery there in the bond market from the the rapid rise, if you will. How does it translate to you personally? Well, real estate, right? So if you're a homeowner, congrats. You know, anywhere really in the U.S., you've you've made. Uh, quite a bit of money due to inflation being higher in the real estate industry, uh, increasing significantly in value. If you're in a popular place such as Austin, then you've benefited significantly from it. However, if you're not a homeowner, then you know, it complicates your problem of not only are houses more expensive, but when mortgages get more expensive, it's harder to meet the, you know, the you have the down payment and then you have all the income ratios that you need to meet to qualify for your mortgage. And that can be increasingly difficult. We've got the 30 year, <clears throat> excuse me, the 30 year mortgage right around 5% now, which, you know, historically is a still pretty good interest rate. But now, you know, lately, if you, if you, unless you zoom out, you know, it seems terrible, right? You've been able to get 3% for basically a decade, it seems, and now it's up at 5%. I don't really see that returning anytime soon uh, back down to the 3% level. So that really stops refinances. I mean, they're all, you know, the, basically nobody left in refinance world uh, unless you had a particular issue that you were working to maybe your own credit scores or something. But uh, really everybody's below the going rate right now. So that means that there are not refinances. So with that, it's just new mortgages that are being issued. And again, uh, the housing market's obviously been on fire, but that can't last forever. Right. So, so a couple of things that are going to lead to some increased volatility. So in summary, Allison, you know, how does it affect the markets? Well, I think it continues to make 2022 a volatile year. I do think this does clear up as the Fed continues to raise rates. Uh, inflation starts to die down some and then interest rates kind of stabilize. I do think it stabilizes here in uh, 2022, though. Next, Bank of America beat earnings this morning. Is ticker BAC a buy, sell or hold? Well, I've always liked Bank of America. I call it my number two uh, to J.P. Morgan Chase uh, in in the banking space. Uh, but as a pure bank, I think Bank Bank of America, you know, <clears throat> is doing great. It's traditionally been undervalued. You know, they came in with eighty cents earnings versus seventy five cents uh, for the estimate, and then of course revenue was higher as well. But the really the the question becomes: How are the banks going to do in a rising interest rate environment? Well, they should continue to 
um, you know, make more money through net interest margin again, which is the difference between uh, what they pay people, which, you know, you have, you know, almost everybody has a bank account that pays very little uh, in interest, right? And they turn around, they loan that money out at higher interest rates. Well, when you do that, obviously there's a margin between the two and, you know, the bank makes the difference. And, you know, I've, I've been kind of hard on the banks. I don't begrudge them their business model. But, uh, you know, I talk about small town America, you know, 10,000 people in a town and they've got a, you know, one McDonald's and seven banks. So clearly money sitting in the bank is obviously very lucrative for banks. When you look at the chart here uh, for Bank of America, just like JP Morgan, just like Wells Fargo, they've all been beaten up uh, pretty hard. You know, down at 125, it was up at 170 not too long ago. It's not even popping this morning on this news. People are just kind of, investors are kind of anti-bank right now. Um, when you really look at the P of nine, earnings per share of 13, I mean, it, it, and for, you know, dividend yield of 3%, these are really at a steal right now. Um, you know, personally, I've been buying uh, JP Morgan. I'm going to look at, you know, I pulled up JP Morgan's chart. No wonder it looks so, so familiar. Um, <clears throat> let me correct that real quick. The, so here's Bank of America's chart, which is probably going to look exactly the same way. Nah, not exact, but uh, same sort of thing. So sorry about that. Uh, but the, the point being, again, ridiculously cheap. 2.2% uh, dividend PE of 10, earnings per share, you know, 3.56, you know, really a steal really, across the banking industry. So I think, yeah, uh, not only is BAC a, uh, a buy in this case, but most of the other banks out there as well. Last, Twitter's board of directors approved a poison pill to try and stop Elon Musk's takeover bid. What is a poison pill? Okay, it's a cool name, right? Sure, uh, poison pill, right? So, what is what happens when your company gets a uh, a takeover bid? The you know Elon Musk announced that he was going to pay a certain amount per share, uh, which was a fifty percent premium to the current stock price, and basically, you know, stock, you know, if, if people thought it was going to go through, the stock price would have jumped immediately to what his offering price is. Well, it didn't, and why not, right? Because a lot of people think that this is there's no way this is going to be allowed to happen. Right, it's going to either the board's going to block it, the shareholders are going to block it, uh, government steps in, SEC. You know, Elon Musk has been in trouble lately uh, with his, you know, funding secured uh, back four years ago now. I think for Tesla, you know, pr price target four twenty, funding secured, or taking Tesla private. Um, you know, the tweets that he's put out, he's faced a lot of scrutiny for that. So a lot of people think that that this is going to get blocked by somebody. I don't know. I'm kind of team Elon. I think he's doing right by the world, making the world a better place and, you know, take, trying to take us to Mars and warning us about AI and, you know, I don't, I don't know, I'm over, overall on his side for the most part. But so why does he want to take it over? Well, uh, I think he thinks he can do it better than the company's leadership. Well, we, we shall see. Uh, but a poison pill. So what you do here is the board immediately meets uh, you know, if you watch Succession or any other shows where the board of directors is meeting all the time, the, you know, you get a takeover bid. Well, the board gets together and discusses the bid and what actions they have. And one of the actions they have is to put a poison bill in place, which is now where they uh, adopt a plan, which they did unanimously, uh, to be able to dilute <coughs> the shares that are out there by putting this specific uh, number in place. Under the new structure, if any person or group acquires beneficial ownership of at least 15%, so again, if he starts buying up shares and gets over 15%, Twitter's outstanding common stock without the board's approval, um, other, excuse me, if you, that was part of the previous sentence, um, but other shareholders will be allowed to purchase additional shares at a discount. So what happens is if somebody starts buying up the shares, the company is now allowed to issue new shares at a discount, uh, which will then need to be bought up, right, by the acquirer or -er. So uh, people can make money along the way just by participating in this. But the, you know, the person taking over, it just became, uh, you know, a lot more expensive for them to be able to do it. They can still do it. Uh, but again, it dilutes each shares, which means the purchaser has to acquire uh, that many more shares and the people that uh, current shareholders are allowed to benefit even more so along the way, in addition to the share price increase that they've already received, right? So uh, wh why would they do this? This is kind of just to slow things down, make him rethink uh, that uh, his decision here to purchase, but I think he's got enough money to where it's not gonna be a big deal. Uh, it says here that you know, Musk already owns a 9% stake uh, in Twitter, so he's not that far off. 
Um, you know, we went through the is or isn't he going to be on the board, and then he came out with the nominee outright take the uh, uh, the company. So anyhow, that's what's going on in the world. That's what a poison pill is. It's kind of a last ditch effort to protect your money from an acquirer. And uh, yeah, so it, it's in, in you know in summary here, Allison, I think this is going to be fun to watch how all this plays out. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. Please submit your questions as a comment through social media or directly to our email at VIPServices at AnchorStarWealth.com. And don't forget to like and subscribe to get daily updates. That's all we have for today's show. I'm Allison AnchorStar, and we'll see you back here tomorrow.